Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Much hasn't changed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And so everyone had to go back to basically their native uh, birth, where they're from, and pay taxes there. They couldn't get online and just figure it all out. They had to geographically move over there. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He did this to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. And at this point, she is great with child. If the Bible says that you look greatly pregnant, then she must have been really pregnant looking. And probably only the Bible can ever say something like that. We can never say anything about that about anybody. Never tell anybody they look really pregnant. But God allowed it to be written in the word for this moment that Mary looked super duper pregnant. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14, we go on reading this story. That when they were departed, this is here after the uh, birth of Jesus. Behold, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and he says, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring you word. Because Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and they departed into Egypt. We move forward down to verse 19 and we'll read on through verse 23. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And the angel said, arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel because though those that sought your life, they're dead. Okay. In verse 21, he gets up, he takes a young child, his mother, he comes to the land of Israel. But then he hears that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod. And Joseph was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, that he should be called a Nazarene. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word today, and I pray you speak to us, and I pray that we would hear your voice today. I pray we hear your word today. Open them, God, so we can hear clearly. I pray we do not miss it, Jesus, in all the busyness of life and in the season we are in, but God, helps, help us to capture what the Spirit is expressly speaking to us in this moment, in this hour. And somebody say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I just want to talk to you for the next couple of moments about the journey. I want to talk about the journey in our portion of scripture that we read in Luke chapter two. And then in Matthew chapter two, there was a lot of traveling going on. There was a lot of uprooting and relocating that happened in these two portions of scriptures that we read. And during the holidays, it's Not everybody's tradition, but it is a common tradition, common enough where AAA always gives uh, a report of the estimated amount of travelers across this country. A lot of traveling happens during the Christmas season. And uh, it just was a tradition with our family growing up. It was the season my dad worked road construction and And he would generally get a couple weeks off of vacation only around the Christmas season. Other than that, my dad pretty much worked like a dog around the clock, crazy hours, ungodly hours. And that was the life that my father led. But when Christmas time came, we would make pretty big plans. And it was around the glorious time of my early childhood where there was 70 cents, 80 cents, 90 cents a gallon of gas. They were wonderful days 
to be alive in. Uh, a tragedy happened when I got my license. It just broke over 99 cents, and it was a dollar and one cents per gallon for gasoline. It was unheard of. It was terrible. I'm sure it never happened in history prior to that. Of course, I jest. And I live close enough to the border of Indiana where we would actually drive a good 20 miles, 15 miles to go to Indiana to pay for gas, 98 cents a gallon, because it was just terrible to think of paying a dollar and one cent per gallon. And so in that 10 gallon, 12 gallon car of that little Mustang that I had, it was a pretty bootleg Mustang. I saved 30 cents because I traveled 20 miles to get 98 cents a gallon of gasoline. I like road trips somewhat. It all kind of depends. I don't know if you're here and you have any plans for Christmas, if you're going to be going abroad, if you're going to go all the way down to Sioux Falls, if you're going to go to Minnesota, if you're going to go to Illinois. I don't know if you have any traveling plans, but it is a common thing during this time. Does anyone like taking trips during the season? All right, we got four people that like trips during the season. The rest of us do not like trips. I like trips somewhat. It depends. There's a lot of variables. Things change over time, I enjoy taking those trips with my family because we would drive all the way from Illinois straight down, not straight down. It was quite the journey. And we would go to Mexico. We would go down there to Rosarito and we would visit my family. And sometimes we would drive to Colorado or Wyoming. We would go to Winter Park or Vail or we would go to Jackson Hole. My family liked to snowboard. It was just a family thing that we would do. Now I look back and I give my parents honor for driving that far with three young children who pretty much fought the entire way. And now that I am older and I travel, it's not as easy where before my wife and I, we would just get in a car and go somewhere. When we first got married, I I want to say it was around our one year anniversary. My wife could probably give better detail and she might give me the head nod during why I explain this story, but we, uh, I got some phone call one time for a timeshare scheme, trying to get us to buy a timeshare somewhere on the East coast where it was what, what Virginia, West Virginia, something like that. And, uh, basically they said we could have a free three day stay at some resort in Virginia. And my wife was super excited by the idea because she loves history. And so we just randomly got in the car and just drove to Virginia. And we had to sit there for some five hour lecture, them trying to get two poor college students to buy a timeshare with money that we did not have. But after we endured the six hour, however long it was, we booked it out of there and we started going all over to Gettysburg and uh, different Jamestown settlements. It was a pretty an amazing trip that pretty much cost us no money because we spent no money other than the gas money it took to go there. But times have changed a little bit. My wife and I have had a few good ideas and thoughts and uh, presentations to go places, but it's not the same. Just to go from just about five blocks down the road to this location here, to come to church, to clean, to do whatever, we would find ourselves taking a half hour, yea, verily, sometimes 45 minutes just to come five blocks over to this location because of my blessed children that I love so dearly. Things change. And so when it comes to making a journey, especially when you get older and you have children, it's not as easy. You There's more to consider when you make a trip. You have to count the cost on so many levels. Now, I want us to think here about the journey that each person took at the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, Mary and Joseph, they traveled uh, uh, far due to taxes, to the census. They they didn't just say, hey, this is a great idea. Let's let's." it would be the scenario of going from Watertown to Sioux Falls pretty much in distance. And they're like, hey, let's just go to Sioux Falls. But it was more than that. They had to go because they had to be part of the tax and the census. The shepherds in this story, uh, in the context here, they were a bit closer than Mary and Joseph. 
and they were more than likely the closest out of everybody we find in the story. The wise men, they journeyed from afar. We don't know how far. We can only speculate. But it was worth it to them, not just to make the trip, but it was kind of a trip that was so worth it to them that they would go the distance and they would even bring gifts. It is in our nature, sometimes conscious, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes unconsciously, to assess if a road trip is worth it. There's times that we have got in the car, went somewhere, and then we realize about 10 minutes in the trip, and my kids are already crying about, are we there yet? I wonder, was this worth it? There's a lot of things to consider on a journey. There's a lot of things to consider on a trip. How far? How long? How much is it going to cost? Or maybe one of these very important considerations, with whom will I be traveling with? Some people can just make or break a road trip. But there's a far greater question to contemplate. What for? What am I taking this journey for? What is the purpose of my journey? Ultimately, the what for determines if the other factors are worth enduring, spending, or putting up with. If you have a valuable what for, it doesn't matter how far, it doesn't matter how long of a trip, it doesn't matter how much it's going to cost, and you might even tolerate with who you will travel with, all because of what the journey is about what the journey is for. Mary and Joseph didn't have much of a decision in the journey. As we mentioned here, their trip to Bethlehem, as grueling as it was, they had to be there. It was around 90 miles in estimated travel Mary and Joseph took. To help you understand, if you were a healthy person going at a healthy pace, a pretty fast pace, you would travel up to 20 miles a day in their time period, in the path that they chose. Their path had some flat lands to the geography, but there was mostly hills. There was up and down along the way of their journey. And part of their journey, they had to go through some forested pathways in some parts where there would be wild lions, there would be bears, there would be robbers, there would be perils. Not only that, but it is in the winter time at which they traveled in the desert in the winter time you think oh man the desert it's probably a nice cool 70 degrees but if you ever been in a desert in the winter time or when the sun disappeared it gets cold quite fast and it gets even frosty and once in a while it could even snow and in that season of the pathway they took it is a path that would be in the 30s and it would be rainy And there's just one minor detail we might have overlooked in their journey. Is Mary's nine months pregnant. Ninety miles in the desert, in the forest, in the hills, in the plains, with bears, with lions, with robbers, in 30 degrees and raining, a nine-month pregnant woman whom the Bible says she was great with child. This lady was just a couple weeks shy of giving birth. And so perhaps maybe it is estimated that if they kept up a healthy pace or a doable pace, they were traveling 10 miles a day to get where they were. Not in a nice, comfortable Mercedes Benz that, you know, you can rely and have a recline back and have seat warmers and, you know, or you could even turn on the AC on the seat if you needed to. It was not that kind of journey. It was grueling. It was rigorous. It was 10 miles a day in the desert, in the forest, on a donkey here about nine days, maybe two weeks. We're not sure we can again, only speculate. Everyone say the journey. Now the shepherds, they took the risk and their journey of a long lunch break. I might stay longer than an hour. Now they might've probably, I would guess in the uh, shepherds that were accountable and they probably got someone to cover their shift. They probably had someone to help them. 
But these shepherds didn't have as long of a journey, and they weren't there with their children more than likely at that time of night. The wise men, they did travel far, however, and they knew the dangers of travel, the thieves, the wild animals. They were strangers in a strange land. The expense of the journey and the cost of the gifts. But all of the shepherds and all of the wise men, the determining factor was what the journey was for, what the journey was about. They were responsible shepherds that wouldn't just leave their flocks for or just a nonsensical purpose, but there was a deep meaning and purpose enough to provoke them to leave their flocks that they are responsible for. These wise men in the depths of their studies and all the things that they were exposed to and that they could be involved in said, I am going to take the chance of a road trip and possibly not even know exactly where to find this Messiah. But I just, I just know that that star signifies more than anything that I've been invested time and study into that star signifies a trip of a lifetime that will never happen again. And so they decided to put all their other studies and all their other purposes aside and said, you know what? I know it's inconvenient. I'm going to have to leave my wife with the kids for a long time. I'm going to have to leave my, uh, my students that I'm teaching at the lecture hall that I'm a professor over, but I've got to make this journey. And here, these people, different distances, all of them with various factors, various costs, believed that what the trip was for, what the journey was about, was more important than any inconvenience. What it was for was worth how much, how far, how long, And with who it was worth it all to them. I believe today it still is worth that much, even though it might be an inconvenience at times to come to a church on Sunday or to be in the house of God in this season where a lot of people might be on the road with family and we're not slamming, damning or condemning that. I understand that, but I want you to know any that lays anything aside for the journey to the house of God in the season of God that we are upon. I promise you it is worth it all, no matter how much, how far, how long and with who. Can we lift our hands for a moment? Can we thank Jesus? Thank you, Jesus, Lord, for showing us this journey that you've invited us to be upon. And God, I willfully, I cheerfully step onto this path. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Now, as I mentioned, some people, they have a lot further to travel in getting to Jesus. The wise men travel further than the shepherds. And some people have a lot more to lose financially getting to Jesus. What would make someone travel that far and spend that much? Now, Mary and Joseph may have had to make the journey to Bethlehem because of the census and the tax, but they didn't have to take that journey pregnant. And what I mean by that is Mary could have told the angel no. And Joseph could have told Mary no. The idea presented to Mary is that she had the favor of God and with the permission of God, she can carry the son of God. And she could have said no. God would not force himself upon anybody. But she decided to say yes. And Joseph, when he found out what his wife carried, could have said, no, that's not my child. And so it's not my responsibility. They could have went to Bethlehem at a greater convenience without a nine month pregnancy on their hands. But when Mary and Joseph knew what for the journey 
was worth it. They were willing to say yes. They said, yes, I'll be misunderstood. Yes, this journey might cost me some of my friends. I'll stay with her in this journey, even though it doesn't make logical sense. I'll make the trip to Bethlehem, though it's a greater inconvenience by saying yes to God. I'll make the trip to Egypt to escape death. I'll make trips to the parts of Israel to escape death because of this child. I'll even make my stay in my abode in Nazareth because of this child. These people took that journey and they knew what it was all about. That's a lot of traveling. That's a lot of trips going to Bethlehem in their pregnancy, then traveling with a newborn to Egypt and not just a travel to go see friends or family, but the purpose of their journey was to preserve the life of them and the child that was at threat to be destroyed, to be slaughtered and killed. They then again. Rooted and located then to Israel, to different parts, just to try to find safety. And just when they felt a moment of relief and safety, then they get news that they're still in the proximity of persecution. And so once more, they uproot their family to relocate and to hide in Nazareth. Talking about the journey. I say all of that to say this to you today. Are you willing to take the journey? How much? How long? How far? And with who? But if you know what it's for, you'll say yes. You'll absolutely be confident that this is the journey of a lifetime. It's the journey worth taking. And I want you to consider and take pause in this day to day to ask yourself, what is this journey for? Why am I on this path? Why am I sitting here in the Jesus church today on this Sunday when I could have maybe saved some time, some energy, some stress and some inconvenience? Why am I here today? Some travel longer distances and pay greater prices to take this journey. We talked about this a month or two ago when we addressed about some persecution. There's people that pay some high prices to be on this journey to be on this path. Why would they go to such great lengths and pay such great prices? It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever been to a church camp or a church conference, if you're, if you're trying to get a feel and you learn who's around you, you might ask them where they're from. And if you're not heard of the town, you'll ask them, well, where is that? How far away is that? And you might be really amazed because you'll find a person drove eight hours to be at church camp. I've been at uh, Alaska and I preached their youth convention. I preached their youth camp and there would be students that would travel over 24 hour periods just to make it to youth convention in their own state. To make it to church camp in their own state. You go to places like the Rocky Mountain District where people will drive 18 hours just to make it to a meeting. Or South Dakota, we feel pretty, you know... Uh, uh, adventurous being here in Watertown and driving some seven hours to church camp on the other side of the state. It's not a common thing people do. I love what Brother Doug said in, in that farewell service about one thing that Pastor Welch taught him, and it was how to travel to God. And Brother Doug made a statement like this when Brother Welch said, hey, let's go down to Sioux Falls this Friday. And he said, what do we go to Sioux Falls for? Well, there's a church service going on down there. Why would I drive to Sioux Falls for church? But after he made the journey, he realized what the journey was for and what the journey benefited him and how it profited him. I promise you, the journey may seem like 
overwhelming or more than we can chew. But if we would just know what the journey is for and just start walking on that path when you arrive, and it's going to take a lifetime to arrive, but when you finally arrive on the other side of eternity and you're there not at the cradle of Jesus, you're at the throne of Jesus, and you realize, wow, I'm glad I made this journey. I'm glad that I took this trip. It cost me a lot. It took a lot of effort. But Jesus, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house. There's always, you know, every once in a while you turn to somebody and you'll find out that that's the city, you know, the city you're having church camp at and the, the, the town you're having church convention at, that's their town. And then you're like, well, I had to drive eight hours to get there. And they, they basically just got to roll out of bed and the church was right there for them. Don't be mad because someone else has a different journey than you. Just get to the same place. That's what matters. Don't look at someone in this room and be like, well, I pay a bigger price because I'm poor. And you don't understand because my family, they're not into this. And your family isn't. It. Don't be comparing. And that, that is the most unhealthy way to arrive at the same place. I'm thankful. Look, if you've never been persecuted and no one's ever mocked you for your faith and you're saved, I rejoice with you. I'm happy for you. But don't get a chip on your shoulder because you think that you took a greater uh, risk and you had a greater path than someone else. I'm just thankful that we're here. I'm just thankful to be saved. I'm just thankful that I'm allowed to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Because here's the truth of the matter. No one traveled further and paid a greater price for their journey to Bethlehem on Christmas night than Jesus Christ. Nobody. Not Mary, not Joseph, not the shepherds, not the wise men. Nobody traveled further and paid a greater price and inconvenience for their journey than Jesus Christ. And so you might have thought you paid a great price to be here today, greater a price than I've even paid. I'm just telling you right now, it doesn't matter who paid what kind of price. None of us paid the ultimate price that he paid for us to be here and to even celebrate a thought of Christmas. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says this. You know, or at least we ought to know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake. Someone say my sake. For my sake, though he was rich, he became poor. That through his poverty, we might be rich. The Almighty became the all tiny on that day in that cradle in Bethlehem. The one that supplied all needs is now crying for his needs. The one that had no beginning and no end now is begotten, is now born. How do you birth eternity? One that knows no beginning now has a beginning in time. One who never felt pain now feels pain. No one that's ever had to gasp for air now gasps for his first breath outside the womb. One who has never wept tears is now in tears. One that's never been handled or touched by humanity is now being cradled by humans. One that has never slept is now waiting to be consoled so he can take a nap. One that was never vulnerable is now exposed. One that's never been dependent upon anything or anyone is now the most dependent person at that time. He never had trouble communicating, but now they're trying to discern and differentiate what the cry signifies. Nobody's made that kind of journey, my friend. Nobody. 33 years, his life on this earth, he came 
to his own and his own received him not. You know, the Bible says that to God, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years to God is like a day or to help with that. That scripture is trying to do is to help you and I get somewhat of a grasp of what time is like to God. Because God is eternal. And so time means nothing to him. It's, it's, it's like he's not like in a rush. He's not worried. He's eternal. And he could show up at any place in the timeline at any time. So to God, for us to try to contemplate, it's like, it's like to God, well, oh man, it's been 24 hours. Oh, well, it's actually been a thousand years. Or after a thousand years, he, oh, it's only been 24 hours. Yeah. To God, that's what it's like for time. And so now he who knows no concept of time is confined to time. He's in time. Now he's still in his throne. He's at all times, at all places. But now he feels time. He feels it. He's condensed to time. He's trapped by time. And I can only imagine the thought of an eternal God now in time begotten. And now that thought comes in the mind of God in the flesh. A thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. And more than likely for Jesus, every day probably felt like a thousand years. Because he's limited, he's confined, he's subject to pain, to death, to sickness, to people. And now it's like, oh, I made it through another thousand years or 24 hours. And if you were to take that scripture in a literal sense, Jesus spent 12 million, 45,000 years on earth. If it was that tough for eternity to be confined to time. 12 million, 45,000 years. Jesus, it felt like to him when he said, I thirst. To confess he has a need. For him to say, I am hungry. For him to now be tempted. To be touched with feelings. To suffer. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8. I'm just about done, church. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. If you can start thinking this way. Who Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But look what Jesus did. Made himself of no reputation. Jesus, we sang that song and, oh, I just felt the Holy Ghost. I know some some folks were just kind of staring there with their hands folded. That's fine. But I'm telling you, when you think about he was Lord at his birth. Wow. That he would completely humble himself and become one of the greatest reputation became of no reputation. And he took on the form, not of a taskmaster or the leader. He took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. My friend, nobody took a journey like Jesus took a journey that day. This Tuesday as we celebrate Christmas, I know it's not the exact day of Jesus' birth, but it is a day on a calendar where at least you and I ought to pause and reflect and consider whatever journey that you're on right now and whatever you're going at through your pathway, I want you to know there is one who his journey was unlike any journey before. Though he was God, he took on the form of a servant, made himself of no reputation, made in the likeness of men. And look at verse 8. He did all of this, being found in the fashion as a man. He humbled himself. The day God humbled himself. Oh, why would God need to do that? Why would God need to humble himself? He's got every right to boast. He's got every right to be sovereign. He's got every right to be praised. And God humbled himself and he became obedient. The one who gave humanity instruction and gave humanity the law and gave humanity the 
commandments and gave humanity holiness, he became obedient. He submitted himself to death, even the death of the cross. One of my favorite verses happens to be the shortest verse from the Bible, and it's John eleven thirty five. And I can hardly ever say those words without pausing and feeling emotion when you realize what is packed into that one verse. Jesus wept. Jesus wept that God would be made subject and that he would feel what you and I feel, that he would be vulnerable, that he would be close enough to another human and that his friend Lazarus would die and Jesus would be stirred by the death of a friend on earth and he would begin to weep. He would begin to sob. Listen, you're not a sissy for sobbing. You're not a wimp for crying in the presence of people when it's about Jesus Christ. There's no powerful being like God. There's no warrior or captain of our salvation like Jesus Christ. And if God in flesh could be sensitive to the needs of others, perhaps we can. Can we lift our hands for a moment? I promise you, I'm just about done. Can you call on the name of Jesus for a moment? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, you made a journey. I thank you for that journey, God. I thank you that you would take the journey. I thank you, God. Though there was a great gulf fixed between you and I, there was, Lord, a great span, Lord, a chasm between the eternal and the temporal. And God, you branched over that and you were born into this world. Think of all the miracles Jesus has done, folks. Opening blind eyes, popping open deaf ears, causing the lame to walk, healing leprosy, calming the raging sea, bringing the dead back to life. He easily could have just saved us by his word. He could have just spoke salvation into existence and saved us by his word. But instead, the word became flesh. My goodness. Instead of just speaking the word, the word became flesh. He easily and sovereignly could have chosen to appear on earth as a 33-year-old adult and died the same day he arrived for our sins. But instead, that journey Jesus took, he took the scenic route. He made sure he pulled over at every stop. He took the time for every stop. I don't know if you've ever felt that as a parent or you're driving with your kids and they see something like, oh, dad, dad, can you pull over? Can you pull? And you want to pull over, but you can't. You just know you can't. You've got timeline to meet. The trip is only so far and so long. But Jesus didn't take the interstate. He didn't take a shortcut. He didn't take an airplane. He took the scenic route. And he took his time. He took 33 years. He took every part of the path. He experienced all of life. He never bypassed the process. He never took the shortcut. He never took the interstate to get there faster. Of all the miracles Jesus performed, you will never find in your Bible the moment Jesus places his hand upon a baby and turns him into an adult. He never fast forwards the process. He wants people to take the journey. In Luke chapter 2, verse 51, the Bible says, as it gives a glimpse of Jesus at the age of 12 when he is separated from his parents because he went to the temple and his parents were caught up in the busyness of what was going on. And there was days that went between the distance of Jesus and his parents. And they finally find their son. And he's like, the parents are just all flustered. Like, what in the world? Where were you? Where were, where were you? And after they lecture Jesus, the Bible says this in verse 51. He was subject to them. 
Jesus submitted himself to the process. The same question I ask us, why would we take the journey? I want you to understand what we would ask Jesus. Why did you take the journey? It was long. It was treacherous. It was costly. But remember the what for. The purpose. Why would you take the journey, Jesus, when it cost so much? When it was so long? And when it was so treacherous? See, what the journey is for determines if all other determining factors are worth it. And Jesus said this. You. You're what it's for. And you are worth it. Jesus took this Christmas journey for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God became man. God gave himself. He was born so you and I could be reborn. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Jesus thought you were worth it. Do you think he's worth it? You were worth the journey Jesus took on that Christmas birth. Is he worth the journey to you? In Hebrews 4, 15, 16, I just got four verses I'm going to read. Two from Hebrews and two from John, and I'm done. The Holy Ghost is here. See, we don't have a high priest which can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I mean, Jesus, who we serve, who is our high priest, he's not cold and callous and immovable. He is affected by what affects you. He is touched by what touches you. And in all points, he was tempted like as we are, but without sin. Jesus would dare to expose himself to temptation because he loves you that much. And so let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace so we could obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What that verse is letting you know is he took the journey. So it's not a difficulty for you to take the journey to his throne. He made the journey to that cradle, to that manger. So you can boldly take the journey to a throne in your time of need. That is what Christmas is about. The, and I know how difficult it may feel for you to be here today. I know how difficult it feels, the life that we have been a part of, the things that we have gone through. But see, Jesus said, look, I took the scenic route. I made every stop so you can, in your moment, on your path, you can find a rest area. You can find a rest stop. And you can find the throne to help in time time of need because at that point nobody could enter into the throne room nobody can enter into the holiest of holies but a high priest once a year if the lot was cast upon him and if God received the sacrifice but today if you're in need in your journey you could take a rest and you can enter into the throne of grace and you can find help in your time of need I don't know about you but I want to take a rest for a moment I want to come into that throne room for a moment. Jesus, thank you for being born in a manger, in a cradle, so I, Lord, could come before your throne today. Thank you, Jesus. I know it costs you something to be here today. I know some of you, there's chasms in your family right now today because of the journey that you're on. But remember, at every point of your journey, there's always a rest area. See, when you go on a road trip with your family, it might be 13 miles down the road before the next rest stop. It might be another 30 miles down the road before you can get to the next gas station. But on the journey with Jesus Christ, there's a rest area everywhere you go. You could always just put it into park and get to that place with Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that I got a rest where I can be caused restful in the presence of God when I'm weary. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. 
As we stand together and we read John chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Oh, thank you, God. I 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 thank you, God. Mm. Now, Jacob's well was there. This is Jesus in his beginning stage of ministry around the age of 30. And there he's wearied. Look at this. Jesus is at Jacob's well. You know why? He's wearied with his journey. I know the road is long. And I know it gets you weary. But don't be weary in well-doing. Realize what he went through so we can make it through on our journey. (laughs) Jesus made such a leap through space and time so he can be birthed into this earth. And he took on so much. God Almighty that never rests, never slumbers, now is even wearied in his journey. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, that who for the joy that was set before him, you were always in front of him. He didn't just see the cross. He saw what he was going to nail to that cross. And that was your sins and my sins. Jesus was wearied on his journey. And so he sat on the well in verse 6. And it was about the sixth hour. And it was at noon. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus turned to her. Here Here is God. That can give us anything we want because he has all power in heaven and earth. He, he goes to someone else and says, can you give me something to drink? I'm weary. I'm weary. Can you, can you nourish me? Can you give me something to drink? And today Jesus is here in a room full of Samaritan people in a room full of Gentiles. And he's just saying, look, I took a long journey. I did it for you. Would you give me something to drink? And today, we can give Jesus something to drink. And that's our praise, our thanks, and our worship. And he, as he receives the wells of praise, the fruit of our lips, Jesus just smiles and says, the journey was worth it. I've been on some tough trips with my kids before. And oh, man, the road trips, the hours, the crying, the complaining. But once we get to that destination and the joy of my kids and the feedback I get from them, I just I could breathe a sigh of relief as a father and say it was worth it. It was where I'm dead dog tired. I'm beat weary, but oh, it was worth it just to see my kids give me drink, to see them give me a hug, to see them say thank you. I wonder right now if we can just thank Jesus for these next few moments around this altar, that he would take that journey and that we would realize Christmas was a journey for God. And I'm thankful that he took that journey so I can find rest at anywhere I'm at in my journey. Come on, folks. This journey is worth it. This path is worth it. This process is worth it. It's going to be worth it all. I thank you, Heavenly Father. I thank you, wonderful Savior. I worship you, God. I thank you, Lord, that you would take the time, Lord, as an eternal God, to be subject to time. I thank you, my Savior, I thank 